Hello, my name is David Quinn, and I'm a member of this church. I have served on the celebrant team, I am on the Woods Council, and I am the coordinator for Sacred Bridges Cups. Cups, which is spelled C-U-U-P-S, stands for the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. Cups is a national affiliate association within the UUA, and there are chapters all over the country. It's an organization dedicated to networking pagan-identified Unitarian Universalists, educating people about paganism, promoting interfaith dialogue, and developing pagan liturgies and theologies. It also supports pagan-identified UU re religious professionals. But what really is paganism? Paganism is definitely not the stereotypical devil worship that the uninformed and frequently antagonistic conservative faiths paint us as. It's, it's also not the overly broad dictionary definition of any non-Abrahamic religion. <laughs> Another thing it isn't is easily defined. I believe the joke goes, ask 10 pagans to define paganism, you'll get 12 answers. <laughs> the definition I give when I'm teaching Paganism 101 is that modern paganism is a culture of many nature-based worldviews and religions deeply rooted in Western esoteric traditions, historical religious faiths, and the spiritualist movement of the late Victorian era. It is a culture that encompasses beliefs that place greater emphasis on the individual search for spiritual communion with the divine than the religious devotion to, any, to the fact or idea of any other person's experience of the divine. One of the only unifying traits of most pagan faiths is the idea that every individual is responsible for their own spiritual needs, and therefore each has a responsibility to explore and experience their own connection to the divine, however they choose to define it. Ian Corrigan, a respected voice in the pagan blogosphere, writes, the practical value of religious activity is the generation of personal spiritual experience. Everything else is side effect. Over the past century, modern paganisms have developed practices that speak powerfully to the emotional and spiritual needs of many contemporary people. But it is important to note that not all pagans belong to the same religious traditions or have the same beliefs or practices. Many people are familiar with, the Wicca, with Wicca as a pagan belief system, but is just one of many, including Druidry, Hellenism, As Asatru, Strega, and many more. There are also many pagans who choose not to focus on one specific set of traditions and instead create eclectic mixtures for themselves from many sources or hold a simple earth-centered spirituality in their, in their hearts. Several traditions under the pagan umbrella could be classified as reconstructionist. These groups focus on recreating the beliefs and practices of pre-Christian religions. They have a great respect for research in archeology span and an avid curiosity about how our ancestors acted and believed. But as valuable as such lore is, it isn't the only way we know about the divine. Some knowledge comes from our direct experience of the gods, ancestors, and spirits, or however we choose as individuals, and as individuals to describe it. In the language of modern paganism, these, in, these experiences are called UPG, unverified personal gnosis. When done right, labeling such information as UPG acknowledges the uncertainty of religious experience. What we experience is undeniably real, but our interpretations of those experiences are subject to error. We cannot expect our subjective experiences to be authoritative for others who didn't share the experience. Our Protestant overculture also tells us that people who talk to gods are crazy. <laughs> Sometimes this refers to the fact that, fact that mystics and god speakers have a rather different take on reality than the mainstream. But it also refers to the fact that some people who claim to speak to gods are genuinely mentally ill. This makes discernment a messy affair. How do we separate the true messages and inspiration from those who are controlled by disease and from those who claim to speak with gods to pump up their own ego or wallets? It's much easier just to quote lore and smack them down. Unfortunately, that also means we ignore genuine wisdom from the gods and we make it less likely that we ourselves will experience them firsthand. Where do you think the lore comes from in the first place? Unless you're a non-theist who thinks the stories of our ancestors were completely and entirely made up, they came from people who believed they had first experience, firsthand experience of the gods. The lore began as somebody else's UPG. 
In my opinion, one of the strengths of modern paganism is that as a community, we have lively discussions about our experiences and their interpretation. Development of language and terms to describe spiritual experiences and, and concepts is the ultimate payoff for such discussions. Terms such as UPG and vertical hallucinations have grown from simple conversations, creating clear definitions of invocation versus evocation, theurgy versus thaumaturgy, exploring archetypes and the agency of deity all benefit us as a culture. Last week, we heard John Royal talk about an experience for which he had no words, and I was in the back row going, I got some. <laughs> Like Unitarian Universalism, uh, modern pagan religions attract many people who, for one reason or another, have left behind the religious communities that they were born into or raised with. Today, we're going to hear from a few pagans about who they are, where they came from, and why they would ever con consider rejoining a church. For me, attending First Unitarian was not actually a return to church. I was raised in an atheist household, so I never attended church regularly with my family. My family educational environment was very rational and scientific, almost bordering on anti-theist. My mother was raised in a Catholic family, so she was the odd one out among her relatives. Her own experiences in education and lifestyle led her to leave the church of her youth. So I was raised without any of the faith-based education that the majority of my peers in school experienced. When I began to explore my place in the universe at the ripe old age of 10, my moms were encouraging, letting me attend local churches of various faiths to make up my own mind. I attended Sunday school with my stepbrother in which I thoroughly flustered the teacher for, by pointing out logical and moral fallacies in the stories that they were telling the children. <laughs> I attended a synagogue by myself, which was a bit surreal for a preteen. And I read lots of books, and the book, and the other the book, and the other the book. None of that inspired my sense of awe or wonder in the world or peace in my, in my heart like a simple walk in the woods ever did. I kept reading, and I came across books on New Age philosophies and eventually paganism. Here was something I could wrap my head around. This was a system in which the authors are talking about spirituality in this world, in this lifetime in harmony and balance with the earth and the universe as it could actually be observed and interacted with. I was sold, and I have self-identified as pagan ever since. I attended my first group pagan event in high school and was amazed at how the ritual was structured around personal connection with the divine and the use of air, earth, fire, and water, and the classical elements, as both manifestations of and metaphor for the forces that affect our lives. I began to truly get involved with the pagan community after having been only a solitary practitioner for so many years. In college, I began to lead groups, and I've been leading and or teaching paganism for most of my adult life. It was teaching that ultimately led my wife and I here to First Unitarian. We were presenting a class on creating sacred space at the Thoreau Center for several established pagan groups, and we'd also publicized the class around town at local shops and on the internet. One of the attendees invited us to come and participate in a ritual with her here, and we did, and it was a good ritual. But later we wondered how it was that a pagan group could operate out of a church. For the sheer sake of curiosity, we attended a Sunday service. It wasn't bad, it wasn't, it wasn't dogmatic, it wasn't preachy, and it, was, and it really didn't talk that much about God which was the fear that we had when we came to a church. Reverend Stringer actually made us laugh. <laughs> we were greeted warmly by the members, even though we wore our paganism openly, and we had many interesting coffee hour conversations. And then one Sunday, a child dedication service. I bless you with water, ancient symbol of purity and clarity and healing. May you see clearly and speak the truth. I bless you with fire. No, no, don't put your hand in there. <laughs> May the warmth of the fire bring you the warmth of love in your heart, passion for living, and whatever work your hands and imagination find to do. I bless you with air. May the winds of the sky and space dance around you, reminding you of the unlimited possibilities of your life. 
May you always breathe the air of freedom. I bless you with earth. I put this dirt on your socks to remind you to play on the earth with joy, to walk gently on the earth, and to be well-rooted in yourself. These were words of blessing that were truly written and spoken and shared from the loves and hopes of this congregation to a brand new soul. I think it was then that I decided I wanted to stay. We took a Pathways class and became members in the fall of 2012. What we learned about the UU principles and sources was very encouraging, quite similar to some common pagan ideals. The inherent worth and dignity of every person is a given in a culture of peoples from any and all backgrounds, beliefs, family structures, and economic strata. In the second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. A common belief in many pagan faiths is some sort of principle of return. You get back whatever you put out into the world in proportionate measure. So we tend to be very active in service, if quiet in public about our faiths. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth and a free and responsible truth search for truth and meaning. The third and fourth principles are pretty well inherent in the definition of paganism that I gave, gave earlier. And my personal favorite, of course, is the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. I became a member of this church because it is welcoming to me and my beliefs as it is to many other beliefs without making me alter either my personal beliefs or practice. By the same reasoning, I would not expect anyone else's beliefs or practice to change simply because I'm here. Interesting fact, 128 people at this church have filled out the connections card with a check, box, with a check in the box for interest in earth-centered spirituality events. We started the CUPS chapter to give a place for those who are interested to come and learn and discuss the practice in a welcoming environment. I'm very proud of this church and its members for its inclusivity, and I'm proud to be both a pagan and a Unitarian Universalist. Hello, my name is Ross, and I'm a member of this church. Some people have asked, why would pagans come to a church? It's a valid question, and one that I quietly wondered about when a very pagan friend of mine would talk about ritual, and then with his very next thought, he would start talking about his church choir. I was curious. I, I found it odd, but I did not ask about it. I, I, honestly, I was worried that the question would offend him but it stuck with me. Why do pagans go to church? Given the fact that by their very nature, pagans are hard to get on the same page, this very difficult question is perhaps impossible to answer in any conclusive form. Or more accurately, perhaps, there's a different answer for every different pagan that you'd ask. As such, the only answer that I can give with any accuracy is my own personal answer. I grew up an only child in the middle of nowhere town of Maxburg, Iowa. There was a Methodist church there and that was the only spiritual option overtly available. That church was the town's center of faith and its meeting place. My mom's weight loss group was there. My high school graduation party was there. That old building was an essential part of my growing up, but I never really felt welcome there. Even when my mom and I took a job doing the uh, church's newsletter, I just did not feel welcome there. I used to make vampire jokes with my friends because I found the place so spiritually uncomfortable stepping into the church. It just wasn't my place. My place was playing in the fields on my father's farm my place was out in nature, 
with the trees and the cattle and my imagination. For many years, I was fairly dismissive of church. I mean, how dare someone thump their Bible at me and tell me what is right? I'm a reasonably intelligent, generally responsible person, and I will figure out for myself what is right. As I grew older and I thought more about organized religion, I started picking out mixed messages. One faith would say that theirs was the correct way, the only way. Their competition would say exactly the same thing. Our way is the only way. If you listen long enough, you come to realize that this proprietary membership race isn't the only thing that the various faiths had in common. They all have a sense of community, of faith, yes, but a general belongingness. When you are part of a church, you are part of something larger than yourself. I desperately craved that community for much of my life. I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder, though. I, I, I won't do what somebody else thinks is right. I do what I think is right. I used to joke that Jesus and I would get along pretty well, but I'll never call myself a Christian. I'll never have that community. So I joined a different community, a community that to me seemed to have no community. I became a solitary pagan. I lived my faith all by myself. I looked for what works for me, and I did not, even for one second, expect what works for me to work for anyone else. As a part of my explorations, I went to a pagan convention held at this very church. For the first time in my life, I entered a church without that icky vampire feeling. <laughs> Over time, I came to realize that this church was exactly what I was lacking, a community. As far as the chip on my shoulder, it didn't really apply here. The policies here are ones of acceptance. The preaching was about open-mindedness and love. Everything else was left for the individual to figure out. But they don't have to figure it out themselves. There was as much or as little support as a person could want. It was perfect. In conclusion, I say that this pagan comes to this church because it is an excellent community. It doesn't matter if you are gay, straight, poor, or wealthy. It doesn't matter if your path leads to Jesus or if you consider Odin to be a close personal friend. Here, the message is about love and support. I can get behind that. I'm okay being a part of that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephen Coverdale, and I'm a member of this church. I started out as a Catholic, and I went to Catholic school. I went to church every day. I went to religion class every day. And I asked questions every day. Some were answered, most were not. My quest for finding a spiritual path started something like this. Do you remember the, that scene in The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy's dog, Toto, draws open the curtain? hiding the wizard. 
Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain, he shouted. That was the aha moment when I discovered that everything that I knew about God, deity, and spirituality came from outside sources. The proverbial man behind the curtain, so to speak. So I became a seeker. I asked a lot of questions with an open heart and open mind. And believe it or not, when you throw out questions to the universe, you do get answers as I did through meditation, dreams, and even wake time. After years of careful investigation, I found that the pagan path was a good suit for me. So I got connected and joined the pagan community. And I've grown so much spiritually since. I have often, often say there is never a time in, during a ritual where I haven't found gain. Now, there were some events held at a church. I believe it was called Wiccacon then, but now is called uh, the Pagan Jubilee. By invitation from my pagan community friends, David Quinn and Andrea Morton, now known as David and Andrea Quinn, <laughs> I went to that event, had a glorious time, but what kind of a church would allow this, I asked myself. The Unitarian Church or something? Uh, you can bet this old boy was going around checking the walls and the foundation of this building, see if it was going to fall down. So I was curious and took a leap and attended my first Sunday service. And to my chagrin, I found David and Andrea seated in the auditorium. They had name tags. They were members? Blasphemy, I say. After all, what respectable pagan would be caught in a church? And then Andrea gets up and sings in the choir. Oh, Lord and Lady, Hecate's done gone to heck. Oh, fast forward, please, for my sake. I'm out in the foyer. I survived the service. Now I was devising my escape plans. East doors to the east parking lot. But before I had a chance to fly down the stairs, an attractive, professional-looking woman ran over to me and looked down at my paper name tag. Okay, I'm short. <laughs> Stephen, is it? Yes. Here, she stuffs a maroon coffee mug in my hands. Bless you, lady. I can use a cup of coffee right now and maybe a sugar fix. But before I can get to the coffee line, I was surrounded by a bunch of the congregation like a swarm of bees on a clover patch <laughs> with Lori herding them, outstretched arms, talk to the new guy, talk to the new guy. <laughs> At that time, I had no idea that the maroon coffee mug was a beacon for people to notice the new visitor. And the questions came, welcome to First Unitarian Church a Unitarian Universalist congregation. How did you hear about us? What brought you here? Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> then the big question came, you know the one. What do you believe in? What is your belief system? Do you really want to know? <laughs> I am hard for a moment. I'm a, uh, um, I'm a, uh, 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 a p p pagan. Oh, sweet. <laughs> I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. And I'm gay. Agnostics, atheists, and gays, and now pagans? What? What kind of a church is this? Oh. And one answered, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, uh, every person. And another, respect for the interdependent web of all existence which we are a part of. Why, that's what I believe. As a first degree Cabot witch, that's almost verbatim to what we believe. So I got connected. First, Steps by Emerson, uh, Laurie Emerson Clare, 
and Pathways by Ellen Taylor and Danny Hoffman. In this class, I discovered there are many pathways and that all are accepted, even pagans. A more truthful version, I did indeed know of this church. A few years ago, watched a, I watched a movie shown here at the church, The Bible Tells Me So, where we learned of the problems parents had dealing with their gay and lesbian children, including suicide. It also covered the trials of gay clergy, and that the Bible doesn't really say much about it at all. So I made it my mitzvah to support the LGBT community, attending rallies and candlelight vigils at the state capitol. Then we mustn't forget the Occupy movement, which led to many activities, including those held here at this church. Even Jesse Jackson was a part of a forum held right here. See where I'm going, going with this? Social justice is important to me. The beacon was flashing. We have a wonderful staff and clergy here, headed up by Mark Stringer, the first in Iowa minister to perform same-sex marriage after the Iowa Supreme Court decision that made it possible. Mark's a hero in my book. I started here right about the time an intern was added. Linda Barnes' sermons were so eloquent that one would want to wrap themselves in a blanket, sipping on a hot uh, mug of chocolate, and relish in the comforting words. And then, we can't forget the orange life jacket and the paddle. <laughs> Social Justice Minister Reverend Erin Gingrich found her blue boat home. Sorry. <laughs> Why? Just a few weeks ago, she had us dancing in the aisles. We became Pentecostals in one Sunday lesson. <laughs> and then the people here, the congregation. You are what I refer to as high order people, people who think guided by reason and experience. I'm in awe, and yes, one of my first sermons I attended here is when a number of you got up and spoke of your awe that's why this pagan is a first Unitarian. Hello, my name is Andrea Quinn and I'm a member of this church. I serve on the celebrant team. I am the public relations coordinator for the Sacred Bridges Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans and I sing in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> When I was growing up, church attendance and religion was not an important part of my life. We were Christian in name, but not in practice. My experience in church was getting picked up by the local Sunday school bus, spending a few hours learning prepared Bible stories and moral lessons, and then getting a return ride home in time for lunch. When I was 13, our family experienced a fire in our home. My little brothers had been playing with a lighter and a candle on a twin bed and decided to place a paper bag over it. When the smoke alarm went off, they came tearing out of their bedrooms wearing only underpants because my mom was at the laundromat and I, having been left in charge, gathered up my younger siblings and bolted to the neighbor's house to call the fire department. Our house was saved by the quick thinking of our volunteer firefighter neighbor who used our garden hose to get a start on dousing the flames. We all returned to our house, which had smoke and water damage confined to one upstairs bedroom and the hallway, but otherwise was structurally okay and deemed safe to occupy. Thankfully, only the curtains and the carpet and drywall had been damaged, and somehow my brothers had managed to think to shut the door before we left the house, so the fire had been contained at just that one burnt out cave that used to be my brother's bedroom. That night, we didn't pray together, we didn't call over a minister, we didn't talk about death or heaven or any other religious aspect. My mother decided that we had all been traumatized enough and didn't get angry or lecture us. She was just thankful that we were all alive. The very next day we were visited by Mormon missionaries who later confessed that they felt odd about stopping at our house because surely people don't live in burnout houses in Iowa, but apparently some do. So our family was there at home cleaning up after that horrible day and scary day. The missionaries offered to come back in an hour and help with the cleanup, and they actually did. And my mom was very impressed by their willingness 
to help us, total strangers. Because of this, she let them talk to her about their church and their beliefs. They told her that she would be separated from her children in heaven if we were not sealed together through their temple ceremonies in the Mormon faith. The thought of this separation tore at my mother's heartstrings, and why wouldn't it? No one wants to think about how close they came to losing a child. So my mother believed and was baptized, and my sister and I followed our mom into the Mormon church. After many years in the Mormon church, trying to conform and live up to the demands and expectations that come with having a common faith and belief, I decided that I needed to have some answers about some doctrines and history of the church. No one would support my questioning habits about some doctrines and my needs for explanations. So I hopped on the internet and I did the unthinkable. I did a Google search. After about six hours of eye-opening reading, I had come to the conclusion that my choice to belong was based on emotional manipulation, and I had decided I could finally leave the church, knowing that it wasn't for me. It had never been for me, and I was not going to make myself fit into it anymore. And after a year about of being an angry ex-Mormon, I used my newly found freedom to ask questions and search for a spiritual practice that worked for me. I was a spiritual seeker and I needed community. I found a group of pagans meeting at the Atlantean in the East Village by using Google to find a metaphysical bookstore in Des Moines. When that shop moved and then closed for good, we lost a home base to, be gather, to gather together. And after that, we just hung out at local parks in the warm months and huddled in tiny living rooms of our fellow spiritual travelers' homes in the winters. And my first experience in the First Unitarian Church was at a pagan ritual. I attended with a women's group called Sisters of the Goddess. I admit to being a bit leery about being within the walls of a church while being part of a pagan ritual, but I set it aside and I gave it a chance. We cast a circle, consecrated the space for our work, and everything was fine. No lightning bolts, no fire hailstones, not even an interruption from a curious onlooker wondering what the weird pagans were doing in their church. Five years later, my husband and I were invited to come to a full moon ritual that was led by a member of this church. This led me to be curious about how a pagan could simultaneously be a member of a church, since I believe that church belonged to Christians, like synagogue belongs to Jews. I attended a sermon given by Reverend Stringer on February 5th, 2012, entitled The Plan. Now, look that up in the archives, it's excellent. I was impressed by the phrase creative interchange this is not a philosophy that was embraced by the religious upbringing of my youth in early adulthood. I found myself attending church voluntarily, week after week, just trying to reconcile the new sensations and freedom of thought and to challenge what I had previously believed. This church was the first place that I had ever heard the word humanist. Listening to Reverend Stringer describe the humanist view that prefers critical thinking and evidence over established doctrine or faith was enough to bring me back to church services again the next week. I was just so surprised that such a viewpoint could be spoken out loud from the pulpit and come from the actual minister of the church. Questioning established doctrine and encouraging critical thinking were definitely opposite viewpoints from the way I had been exposed to religion growing up. We learned that there was an actual organization for pagan groups within the Unitarian Universalist Church that had been in place since 1987. We became members of this church in November of 2012, along with four other pagans at that dedication ceremony, and we collectively decided that we would use the resources that the Unitarian Universalist Church already had in place to start the Sacred Bridges chapter of the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans, the third CUPS chapter in the state of Iowa. We had some opposition to our decision to start a CUPS group, but that came from someone we had known in an open pagan group that we had casually attended for a year. Out of the blue, this individual decided to go on the offense by recording a video on YouTube, denouncing the move as looking for cover under a Christian flag. <laughs> this hurt my feelings, but I knew where it was coming from. I had once had this attitude about the word church and what it meant to the general population. In my former understanding, the words free and responsible search for truth and meaning would not come from a church. 
My religious upbringing had been mostly follow the elders and heed their counsel in all things. I didn't know a church existed that would actually encourage and even expect the members to seek out their own spiritual path and be part of a community that strives for justice and equality for all, that fully backs the rights of people to marry whomever they love and works towards peace and environmental sustainability. Instead of being forced towards a common belief, we are invited towards sharing a common practice of acknowledging the divine spark that resides in all of us. I sometimes liken this experience of finding a church home to visiting a Crocs shoe store. Everyone knows what Crocs are, right? right? Well, it seems that everybody has an opinion about Crocs, whether they've actually tried them or not. Some insist that they are the best shoes ever made. So comfortable and washable, and even doctors and nurses are wearing them. And others are so completely put off by the way they look that they can't even bring themselves to actually place their feet inside of them for fear that they will look like they've put their feet into two big Swiss cheese boats. <laughs> Guess which side I'm on. <laughs> there are folks in the middle who wander by the store from time to time, secretly wanting to try it out, but hesitating to actually do so. They might fit perfectly, who knows, unless you try it out for yourself. As a pagan, I'm immensely grateful to have found a church home, to support it, to sustain it, and to tell others about it. It has truly become a home for me, and I have enjoyed almost all of my time here. The one time that I didn't, I came back anyway, and that's how I became a Unitarian Universalist pagan. <laughs>